going to holler at 200 right here. 200! Woo! Stands up, blood running down his forehead. It's like, I think I hit my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure you did. <laughs> KCC, you missed all of that. No, he didn't miss all of it. I missed a couple times, <laughs> but I, I missed that one. <laughs> Junior, your dad and I used to, we're friends. We can't get his side of the story right now, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> his dad and I talked about this man. already stretching the truth. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> It was worth every minute of it. <laughs> it's the greatest week ever. <laughs> Kenny took good care of me. We had a lot of fun. When that thing started up in the air, I, I just held my hands together and said, Dear God, uh, please don't let this emotionally scar Jeff. <laughs> but it worked out okay. You look at Hinder Motorsports as family, and, you know, I mean, it's just. It changed my life, really. And you drove that. This is the best place you could ever be. If I'd have stayed here, I'd probably still be working here. This is the only team I ever drove for that I never heard anybody say anything bad about the owner. Now, I can't say that about the other teams that I've driven <laughs> for. I can tell you that. If a company doesn't care about its people, the people not going to care about the company. Well, first of all, it's just, it's so neat to be sitting here with you guys, and thank you for 200 wins, and the first win, and I mean, it's just amazing how fast time rolls on, and you think about those old stories, and we got Jeff here. Me? I appreciate well, you started it. it all, you know. You know, and I did, and you've told all these guys that, and I've, I've asked them to send some royalties from what they made off. Hendrick Motorsports, but I haven't received any checks yet. I, mine's in the mail. So. Yeah, it's in the mail. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I blew a lot of engines for you guys. Made the engine shop better. Yeah. I introduced Rick to that's VR. That's because you didn't know when to ship. You know, that's <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was blamed for a lot of failures. <laughs> but you know what? It, it's a pretty good place to be connected with this guy. You know, it's hard to explain how excited I am about this all-star racing team. I think this right here is going to be the turning point of my career. <coughs> Working with CK and Rick, these people are professional, and they're going to run this team in only one direction, and that's to be successful and to win. Yeah, we won our eighth race. Yeah, that was amazing. Any, anyone here beat that record? Jeff Bodine will come across the start-finish line to pick up the victory for Rick Hendrick and that all-star racing team. Worked perfect today. Harry Hyde, the guys and the crew did a super job. And Darlington was right before that, and we wrecked. Trouble in turn number three. I think it's Brooks. And he spins up onto the racetrack, and several other cars are involved. We got caught right up against the wall. Uh, this track's so narrow, there just isn't any room to escape. We were going to close the shop after the, that race. He was going to close the door. He spent a lot more money uh, than he thought he was going to have to uh, dealing with Harry Hyde. Harry said one more race and then one Martinsville. These guys need to thank you and I need to thank you because that's how close we came to not having um, Hendrick Motorsports. So. Uh, you know, Junior, your dad and I used to, we are friends. Loved your dad no, off the weren't. track, but when he put his helmet on, we, we tended to... You never tell that. You can't get his side of the story right now, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> and his dad and I talked about this You're already many, stretching many the times. truth. Go ahead. <laughs> but we used to tear a little sheet metal up once in a while. Earnhardt's climbing all over Jeff Bodine, and that is dynamite. Who's going to get Brown? Here comes Earnhardt. He's moving up on the back deck. Whoa, he bumps. Jeff Bodine. Bodine is sideways. Does a full 360. I have never done anything intentionally trying to wreck somebody. 
That really hurt. We'll all gang up on him a little bit. Bernhardt is pulled right back up on Bodine. Oh, we are alone! Jeff Bodine has smacked the wall hard. It's getting kind of hard to accept when you got a lot of sponsors and crew here that worked hard to put the car on the track. And I guess if NASCAR can't control it, they're going to have an all-out war out here. I got a phone call that night from someone. He said, look. I'm tired of Earnhardt wrecking my cars. If you can't do something about it, I'll get somebody in that seat that will. I didn't have a choice. I had to do something, right, you didn't guys? Have a choice. Remember that? <laughs> I mean, hey, that's not the Rick I know. Yeah, I've never known Dale to be like that either. No, it, it, no that, that whole story is. That, that, like that. that is a bodine fabricated yeah. story. Yeah. That's all that is. <laughs> Made it up from the beginning. <laughs> I know Dale and I know Rick. That's no joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I brought it I'm just yeah. saying. Daryl, of all of your wins when you were with us, what was your favorite, Daytona? Oh, it definitely was. You know, I was with 17 tries, and Junior loved this because people always said, well, what do you think? And, I, and I'm, I'm serious when I tell you this. As soon as I crossed the start-finish line, I didn't think about it. I'd finally won the Daytona 500. I said, I won them before Dale did. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> about the only thing Darrell Waldrop has not won in his stellar Winston Cup career is the Daytona 500. But when he became the third driver in the Rick Hendricks table, the odds became better than ever that he would break a long-standing drought. And we are set to go racing 200 laps in the Daytona 500. Door to door, they go down the front line, nobody pulling out to pass. Boy, Waltrip is in trouble. He's just falling way back. Okay, Darrell, let's go back through. When you get into position, tell me what you want to try and do this car right quick. The car's bottoming out, don't drive good. We got ourselves in a mess, at least we think. Schrader and Earnhardt, who are sparring to decide how this 500 will be decided. Both looking for their first 500 victory. How will it end today? Schrader can tell the story better than I can because he was, he was my teammate and he ran second and I couldn't have won that race without his help. I wasn't trying to help you, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the help of running out of fuel. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. His, uh, his daddy and I Yo. both pitted at the same time. Schrader and Earnhardt both pitting. Schrader came in first, and he barely stopped the tires. They got enough to finish the race, and it looks like they might have enough space to win it. We came back out. You don't think there's no chance that Darrell's not going to pit, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Waldrop and Trot, I think he's going to take the gamble. Are they going to be able to go that 55 laps on the tank of fuel? He is drafting all around the track off anyone he can find. I think he's running on a prayer. One lap to go. Will that fuel last? After 17 years of effort, the Daytona 500 belongs to Franklin, Tennessee's Darrell Waldrop. He's done. I was so excited, the boy Schrader's going to be hot. Because we, we went a little further on fuel than, than he did. I went to Victory Lane, so oh, yeah, I he, was all happy for you. Schrader comes to Victory Circle, and he's all happy. Man, he's hugging my neck. And, man, good job. You won at seven. Oh. How many years did it take you on second? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it took it ten years ago. Ten years ago. <laughs> 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 Tell him about the next day. Yeah, I wasn't so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I was still happy for the, for the team, but I was a little more... That's a hell I'll get it next year, but it really is harder to get than I thought. Well, it took him 17 <laughs> times. <laughs> so, Kenny, well, did you ever win a race? <laughs> oh, no, I didn't get him. So. Let me stop and think. Here they come, all badly for the lead. Bodine comes back up the middle at the line. Schrader. Incredible win for Ken Schrader. It's a wet t-shirt contest. <laughs> Here he comes. This is going to be the biggest one of his life. This one right here will be bigger than Talladega and Phoenix Raider. Cross the line. Checkers are out. Schrader's coming home. Schrader's got to be all smiles. Coming down to get the checkered flag, and Schrader will win. I think one of the races I remember about you was you being in the hospital down at uh, Talladega. Now, why do you got to tell this story? This is not one of his favorite moments. It's your favorite moment. Jeff 
Gordon slipping back. Ken Schrader in the middle, and indeed, Gordon's got a handful. Throw it on turn two. Ken Schrader gets spun around. A tap by Jeff Gordon. Schrader goes up in the air. Barrel rolls three, four times. End over end. He goes end over end about eight or nine times at Talladega, so I go down to the hospital to check him out. He's got this great big goose egg over his eye, and he said, who hit me? And I said... I already knew who hit me. I just wanted to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to hear you say, yeah. Jeff Gordon. <laughs> uh, we just caught a little too much air over there. Uh, I don't know. I think we got turned around a little bit. Somebody caught us the left rear. But um, it just uh, took off, you know. Played sprint car, head down, arms up. Then I said... Hey, would you mind talking to him on the radio yeah, he's, and tell him you're okay? He's tore up on the he's radio. Crying, he's crying in the car. It's a somber mood up here in Jeff Gordon's pit. Ray, you and Jeff have been on the horn quite a bit since this incident. You have a very talented, but you have a very emotional driver. What are you doing to calm him back down after this? I don't know. How do you calm him down? He's about in tears. I mean, he didn't mean for that to happen. I mean, he's a very emotional kid. It's just a real sickening deal when something like that happens. I feel real awful bad for him, and I just hope it doesn't affect him. Up at Senior Shop, Chocolate and Will and them guys came to me the following week. One of them guys said he felt so bad for Jeff when that happened because Jeff was really tore up. You know, and Chocolate's like, I kind of felt bad for Schrader. He was the one tumbling through the air. <laughs> and I said, no, I was worried about Jeff. I said, when that thing started up in the air, I, I just held my hands together and said, dear God, I, please don't let this emotionally scar Jeff. <laughs> But it worked out okay. And he came to Peebly to sign autographs because my shoulder still hurts every now and then. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so I, I gotta have to go to Peebly again. <laughs> you got off easy, sir. <laughs> you know, so we won in 95 and they won in 96. And, and going through that battle that year and seeing the teams keep things from one another and not share, you know, and really, you know, just dislike one another, he had to really start looking at how the teams work together. Because yeah. they didn't work together no, too well yeah. back then. Yeah. And I'll vouch for that. Yeah. <laughs> Going back, Terry, to your championship year, you remember you crashed hard at Phoenix oh, yeah. and broke your hand? Yeah. We won the race at North Wilkesboro up there, and we had that Iron Man car, because I tied Richard Petty's mark for the consecutive starts. Holding off the challenge of the defending NASCAR Winston Cup champion, Terry Labonte wins the first Union 400. We won the race, and so Rick took that car and put it in the museum. So we came down for the championship there, and uh, I said, man, we got to get that car back. You know, we need to take that car to Phoenix. Painted just like it was, like it left Wilkesboro up there. I went out there and ran the first lap. It's pretty good. And I said, uh, this next one's going to be really good. And I went down to turn three, and the throttle hung on that thing. And I tried to turn the switch off. And I had my hand off the steering wheel trying to turn the switch off when I hit the wall. That's why I broke my hand. I remember going to the hospital and uh, kind of figured our yeah. championship deal was over. We were down there in the, uh, in the hospital all night, it seemed like. He said, I'll tell you what we can do. He said, we can give you some shots in that hand. Yeah. And he said, and you'll not feel a thing. He said, you might mess up your hand, and you might have to have surgery on it yeah. when you get home. Get the needle. But he said, you can, <laughs> we can fix it. So I said, okay, I'll worry about that Monday, you know. That's and right, so, the driver in you, buddy. And so anyway, we, uh, we went out to the track the next day, and I ran a few laps in the backup car. Heading onto the track now, the current Winston Cup point leader, Texas, Terry Labonte. It has been an adventure so far. Injured his left hand about three minutes into practice yesterday. Is there a question that you might not be able to go all the way? No, I'm going all the way. 
they've got a little cushion and a cup that will fit inside of his hand to keep it from moving any more than it has to. It looked like it was a disaster for the championship run. We start at the back in the backup car. If there is a racetrack that favors people who start in the back, Phoenix is it. Look at Terry Labonte on the bottom there. That hand must be doing pretty well for him. He's really coming up through the traffic. We actually led the race through pit strategy and stuff. I'm going to tell you, when you're running good as he is right now, it's your dumb all over. It, makes, it really feels good. Why not finish third? The checkered flag comes out. Bobby Labonte wins the race. Come on, champ. Come on, champ. Yes, sir. And Terry Labonte has become the 1996 NASCAR champion. That just really showed how strong our team was. I mean, our team was so good. I will bring a little bit up on that, that year because, you know, so we won in 95 and they won in 96. And, and going through that battle that year and seeing the teams keep things from one another and not share, you know, and really, you know, just dislike one another at times. Uh, I always really? liked you, Terry. <laughs> uh, but we had to really start looking at how the teams work together because yeah. they didn't work together no, too well yeah. back then. Yeah. And I'll vouch for that. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, well, because it was poor, it was like, well, I didn't do very good this week, but damn, outrun the five and the seventeen. So <laughs> we're, we're better than them guys. Them guys are really messed up. <laughs> I'm old school. That's like you guys are. I said, I ain't sharing my information. That ain't gonna work for me. I don't want to tell you know one of those other guys how I, how I won Bristol or how I won somewhere. There was more competition before we got to the track than there was at the track. And in the engine room, particularly, I never hear Andy right. Dorton. Right. I mean, those guys, I had Charlie Seegers do it. He did my engines. And he was going to be sure that, you know, our engines were better than the other three engines. And I remember the day that Randy Dorton came to me and said, look, we're, we're going to change that. We're going to do it like the F1 guys do it. We're going to just machine everything. We're going to have all assemblers. And I remember a couple of guys got upset and left. Yeah. They said, I, I'm not going to do it that way. And it's proven to be the right way to do it. Randy was my crew chief for a couple of weekends. You won, you won uh, yeah. Talladega with him, didn't you? That thing would fly. Terry Labonte jukes to the inside. Everybody follows. To the stripe, it'll be Terry Labonte winning the Sears Die Hard 500. We're down in victory lane there, and I put my arm around Randy, and I said, you don't even know the difference between caster and camera. <laughs> I said, but we have the best engineer. <laughs> he just grinned, you know. <laughs> but uh, he was really the guy that got that engine oh, yeah. room yeah, yeah. organized, yes. straightened out, and got it on top. Here's the man who puts the muscle in the machines. Randy, good to see you. Randy Dorton, uh, who you're in charge of the entire Hendrick Motor Program, right? That's right. They're not model shop made. That's where yeah, they're not handmade. They're production. It might not be on top every single race, but consistently over the years, it's the best. You know, yeah. and he was the guy that really was the brains behind it. They come off of the fourth turn. Darrell Waldrop has scored the victory here. Oh, man, my man, my man, my man. Yeah. It evolves over the years, but you got to have people that, you know, make the commitment that that's what they're going to do. And, uh, and you go through some growing pains with it. In 1987, when we started the Dream Team, and it really should have been I mean, if you look at the people that he, we were able to put together, got, I, I came from juniors, Waddell, one of the best engine builders in the business, Gary Dehart, Eddie Dickerson. I mean, we had in, an ingredients to have the ideal dream team, the perfect team. Oh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, puns that will come out of the car. Uh, the best one I've heard to date, though, is Waddell Wilson and the Bleach Boys. I like that a lot. Another guy told me, he says, if Ty will clean you up, boy, it'll clean up anything. So <laughs> we got a lot to look forward to. You remember that, Rick? Yeah, I know oh, very well. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was too many egos and too many, too many people that felt like they knew a better way. That's the problem with hand-picking superstars 
whether they're a crew chiefs or an engineer from another team or jack men or whatever, everybody had their own ideas. Waddell and I sort of built a wall between us. Uh, we didn't talk as much as we should. That's the nice thing about Rick Hendrick. So many people involved, we can kind of shuffle everybody around and get the right mix. We'll get rid of a few chiefs and there'll just be me and uh, Jeff and uh, the Indians. If you think about it, all the people that we assembled in that original group, whether it's D. Hart, successful with you, Waddell, successful with Ricky Rudd and others, put them somewhere else and they were great. There were too many egos yeah. and it just didn't, it didn't mesh. I know you got tired of trying to convince this group of people that you had you know, that this was the way it needed to work. Yeah. Like the dream team, Daryl forgets that nightmares are dreams Not too. Not good. You know? <laughs> that was a bad dream you had, Rick. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I know you beat your head in trying to convince some guys and you could finally, everyone started to see it. We just made a decision, that's the way it's gonna be. And if you didn't believe in it, you couldn't be here. Cause I had done it in the dealerships and it worked so well. But the key to any business is the people around you and, and that's one of the things we've learned here by growing our guys that grow up in the culture they don't know any different this is the way we've always done it that night Kenny Schrader decided to take Dale out on the town and he went to one of these adult establishments and I guess you weren't old enough to go in so Schrader got the entertainment come out to the yeah. bus. I, it was worth every minute of it. <laughs> it's the greatest week ever. <laughs> the kind of the question that I get asked all the time, and you guys can answer it, you're teammates, but you got to race each other. But you respect each other and your friends, and sometimes you get to rub a little bit on the track, and sometimes there's little situations that we have to talk about it during the week. Look at the aggression and the drive shown by Jeff Gordon. Whoa, they hit! Four times, a little upset. The 48 is testing my patience, I can tell you that. I think you and Jimmy maybe had the same problem up there at Martins for one time. He's got the inside, they touch once, twice, drag race, uh, Jimmy Johnson! Johnson. <laughs> Not quite that bad. No, you didn't wreck. No, no. You didn't, you didn't wreck. We hit one another. That happens. It happens. But, uh, all in all, uh, Jimmy, how do you feel about having three teammates and the benefits and positives and the negatives? Well, I, I grew up um, in developing my skills under a dr uh, another driver, kind of the A-B team. And I was very fortunate to have championship teammates, championship caliber teammates that were willing to work with me and groom me and bring me along. So when my opportunity uh, became available here, it was kind of what I grew up doing and believed in that system. You know, it helped, helped bring me along. With your leadership and the way you've set up uh, the motorsport side, then also the automotive group, as a younger driver coming along, there's so much more to absorb and learn that uh, it'd be very easy for me to enjoy that. And thank you for all the, the help. Yeah, I was going to say, so basically for a very long time, he's been learning from other guys and then making them look bad afterwards. <laughs> Not intentionally, but... <laughs> Jimmy Johnson is the 2006 NASCAR champion. You are the absolute best. I love you to death. Thank you so much for everything. Yes, and you are the man, buddy. Woohoo! GG, thank you for picking me, bro. Buddy, it couldn't have been a better one. You're awesome. Way to go. Jimmy Johnson gets it done, scoring the 200th Sprint Cup win for Hendrick Motorsports. Nice job, boys. 200! I mean, I've had great friends and great teammates here, and we race hard, we work hard, and uh, we've all been known to have, have a good time together, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I see you picked up a little deal that you and I did riding in the window of the car. You rode in the window of Dale's car, but I think Dale was running a little faster than yeah, you were running with me. I think he was in third gear at one point. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think we were going that fast. It was, I started off with my visor up. Yeah. And we got him rolling along, and he clicked third, and I put the Sit visor down. down. Head back. <laughs> <laughs> we were missing a tire. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to stiff you, man. You pulled up, and you spun around. 
and the fans went nuts. And I'm like, I can't say no, but I see a left ears down. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, he'll just go slow. <laughs> I thought we were going slow, my bad. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> they made, made for good TV. In one of the biggest shakeups in NASCAR history, 32-year-old Dale Earnhardt Jr. declared himself a free agent at the end of the season. It became apparent to me the man I wanted to drive for. I've known him since childhood, and so today it is with great honor to introduce my new boss for 2008, Mr. Rick Hendrick. Dale, how about you? When you, you know, you were used to having three teammates. Yeah, it was, I, I came from quite a different situation, driving for my own family, and I only had, you know, one teammate for the most part. You know, there wasn't a lot of, you know, working back and forth as not as much as we do now. The technical side's been the biggest surprise. Just really kind of getting in, getting in there, and the meetings and all the, all the stuff. Everybody's so thorough. You know, from the engine shop all the way down, it's so incredible. Coming to the line, Dale Earnhardt Jr. wins the 2008 Budweiser shootout, scoring the first victory in his tenure at Hendrick Motorsports. Jr. hoping to win everything this week at Speed Weeks at Daytona, and so far he's two for two. He has won the first race of the Gatorade Duel in his 15th start for Hendrick Motorsports. Finally, Dale Earnhardt Jr. is going to score a points paying event. Yeah, baby! <laughs> Speak about not believing that you have a teammate, and, and I didn't think I'd have Junior as a teammate because, yeah. <laughs> well, well, one because I remember meeting them when he was. I don't know how old were you when I met you. I had to been about 20, 21. I was talking to your dad, and you know I think we were out there on pit road. And I don't know something. I, I, I was sitting the on pit road, and he walked up and said, "I want to introduce you to this guy. You're gonna hear more about this guy," and it was Jeff. Wonderboy is here. I, I hear him talking about me. You talk like a little girl. What? I'm sorry, man. I'm just not as big as you. And so I remember, you know, him, young, coming up through the ranks. And I mean, he was so young. I just, I go, man. You've pretty much grown up in a sport. Would you like to have a career in racing? And if so, what would you like to do, Dale? Well, I, you know, I want to be a race car driver someday. It's a great sport. I love it to death. You know, it's, you know, it's all I've ever known. Racing. I didn't even know if I'd see you in Cup because I thought I'd be long gone by then. It seemed like you were so young, uh, but but then to have you as a teammate, it's pretty amazing how how far things have come. Yeah. But boss, I gotta say though, I, you know when I came on board, uh, Schrader was my teammate. That was a bad. Well, that was a bad influence. <laughs> so, so I got to hear a lot of stories and learn from him. <laughs> well, I can tell you going with Schrader. You sure you remember? I think I do. All right. I think I was I was out at Topeka. That was on a like a Saturday or Friday. That night, Kenny Schrader decided to take Dale out on the town, and he went to one of these adult establishments. And I guess you weren't old enough to go in, so Schrader got the entertainment to come out to the yeah. bus. And uh, so. I didn't know anything about it, but I happened to be on the grid the next day when your dad flew in. You and him both flew in that day. Yeah. And he walked up to me, you know, he used to get you by your collar, and he said, I'm going to kill Schrader. But I told him, don't look at your dad the next day on the airplane. Don't look at him. For sure, don't breathe on him. And, <laughs> and don't fess up to nothing. I don't know how he found out. I went as far away as I possibly could from where he was <laughs> on, like, race morning. And I was just sitting there on a tire, with, you know, just trying to hide. And Dad come out there and looked at me and then just turned around and walked off. And then uh, he turned Schrader the next week. I mean, he ran over him four or five more times after that. <laughs> I think Schrader said they didn't talk for years. That was he it. was pretty hot. It was he? Yeah. The next year, I called him and said, <laughs> I said, hey, we're going to Topeka again. He said, yeah. I said, think Dale Jr. would go? He said, no. I said, what about Kelly? <laughs> she didn't get to go either. <laughs> I, it was worth every minute of it. <laughs> it's the greatest week ever. <laughs> yeah, Kenny took good care of me. We had a lot of fun. Jeff actually lived with me for a little bit. Jeff came to see me, and uh, I'd always invited him to come see me, and he 
never, you know, he never good. did. You know, he lived right. in a great big mansion down in Florida. And then one day he says, you know, I'm, I'm in town. As you said, I could stay with you. Can I come over? And I said, sure. And when he walked in, he was sweating all down. His shirt was all wet. And I knew, I didn't know he was going to tell me he was leaving to go drive somebody else or what was going on. But then he told me, he said, you know, I think I'm, looks like I'm going to be getting a divorce. And so I said, okay, well, if you're going to get a divorce, I'm going to give you some advice. You know, there's three things you don't do. You know, you don't hit her, you don't leave her, and you don't get caught with your pants down. And so that weekend, I think he did two of them anyway, you know. <laughs> I love when you and tell a story. <laughs> The only thing I remember, I mean, other than I felt like I was 17, you know, because I, I had to be, well, you I had were in, to be, I you were in the kitchen. I walked in, we were going through construction, and you had this pizza, and you know, you were putting it in the, in the oven, and then you, were, and you walked out, and you said, I'm going to the mall, and I said, okay, son, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I really felt like I was 16, 17. <laughs> I had to be home by 10 o'clock because the alarm was going to be set on at that time. You know, I had curfews, and I had an awesome time, you know, being able to, to spend that kind of quality time with Rick and Linda and trying to figure out my whole life what was going on. I couldn't have been around two greater people oh, yeah. and, and had better frozen pizzas <laughs> than, than at your house. we've ever talked about it but after the crash you know the days leading up to uh, Atlanta and the services and everything that went on you know there was there was a time there where we're all wondering what's gonna happen you know where what's gonna happen to motorsports our company is awful special and you go through tough times and you lean on each other and I've always believed you know, people are your biggest asset, and I can, I can tell you now that the folks here—I mean, Jimmy, Jeff, and uh, all of the the employees here—when the uh, crash happened and we lost so many people, and uh, didn't know that I could actually come back over here. Earlier today, a Hendrick Motorsport aircraft disappeared from the radar, trying to land outside of Martinsville, Virginia. Among the 10 killed in the crash, Hendrick Motorsports lead engine builder, Randy Dorton, Rick Hendrick's brother, John, and son, Ricky. I came and I remember you were the first person I saw in the museum and uh, how emotional it was. That day that you came over here, he, the last place he needs to be is here with us, you know, but yet that's the kind of person that you are. And, and you were grieving, and, and you came here to express, you know, your thoughts with us. And to me, that moment changed things for us here at Hendrick Motorsports because, you know, everybody went to Atlanta and through those next couple of weeks with a whole new mission and, and purpose and you drove that because you came here that day and, and you took the time for, for, for this family. To me it elevated over those next couple of weeks this organization to a, another level that, that you just you can't create that yeah. on its own. Uh, I'm not sure we've ever talked about it but after the crash you know the days leading up to uh, Atlanta and the services and everything that went on you know, there was, there was a time there where we're all wondering what's going to happen, you know, where, what's going to happen to motorsports. That was a just interesting week. I mean, just a lot of weird emotions floating around and, and wondering what was going to happen, you know, for everybody. But then we had to go to the track, and I don't think anybody was ready to go to the track again. And then we had to go through another media session at the track, and that kind of pulled the Band-Aid back off again. This team's going to be stronger than it's ever been, and I don't think I've ever seen anything uh, that's going to pull this team together any closer than it can get. I, I can't think of, of, of anything that could drive us harder and stronger than, than, than this loss. And amazing people do amazing things in times like this, and I think that's what's going to stick out in my mind the most. New leader Jimmy Johnson 
Johnson is trying to do something special for all the people of Hendrick Motorsports and take the family to victory lane. Atta buddy, come on, bring it home. Bring it home. And loving memory all the way. Then to win um, the race and us all standing in victory lane. You can feel the purpose why we're at the track, you know, and honoring all of our friends and, you know, how important racing is to all of us and, and why we do it. This is unbelievable. I just talked to Rick on the phone. He said, put my hat on backwards for little Ricky. <laughs> so there it is for little Ricky, uh, Randy Dorton, Joe Jackson, Liz and Dick, Jeff Turner. I had 10 angels riding on this race car. Well, it meant so much to see you guys because it, it, you are family and I think uh, to honor those folks and and to do it for the rest of the people that are here you know to me I never forget it when we win a race and we acknowledge all those people we lost by wearing our hats backwards and uh, and I remember you started that because uh, you and Ricky I never liked to see him with his hat on backwards and I walked up one day in the garage area and you and Ricky had your hats on backwards and you weren't driving for me then and then then I think they won the the Bush Championship, and then uh, Vickers put his hat on backwards. But uh, it's kind of carried on, and I know you guys really helped me help me through that. That was a uh, that was a hard time, but uh, I think it did create a tighter knit deal here. So for sure, definitely. Well, there was a lot going on with Ricky I didn't know about. There's a yeah. lot more going on that I didn't know about, too. <laughs> and I think Jimmy poured Tide in the, in the pool, and y'all were having a party. Jimmy was. That's just were you I was there? asleep. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you took I, me. I was sleeping. Yes. I was. Were I you there? No I was your driver. <laughs> that was well, a I mean, different concussion. At one point in my life, <laughs> I think we were celebrating a win, like a Dover win or something that I had. And a few of us were jumping off shallow. And then one guy, I'm not going to name anyone, but kind of took it was an <laughs> Okay, it was oh, Earnhardt. Oh, yeah, it was. <laughs> took a bad angle and yeah. kind of went down. Never forget, st stands up, and blood running down his forehead. He's like, I think I hit my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure you did. <laughs> he told me later that when he was wearing that do rag, that's what that he was wearing. That was the reason. Yeah, Everybody's like, man, that's, that's cool. <laughs> I'm like, yep, yeah, yeah. cool. <laughs> Cool in the pool, right? Yeah. Casey, see, you missed all of that. No, was, he didn't miss I all of it. A times. <laughs> yeah, dude, I wasn't at that. I wasn't at there that time. But I, I was at Ricky's a couple times and enjoyed going down there and stuff. But I, I missed that one. It was just really a networking opportunity. We weren't having much fun. It was just to try to get to know one another and hopefully well, end up. Future drivers for Hendrick. Future drivers. <laughs> Ricky was doing what worked for HMS was all. Well, that was. He uh, did it well. Look what <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he did a good job. He did a good job. Well, Casey, it's good to, you know, this is your first year. I remember the first day I met you, you were awful nervous. We got together at the house and we're trying to figure out how to gap uh, a year in there when you, we wanted to sign you because you had another opportunity, but it was uh, a year before we'd have a seat. Yeah, tell us how that conversation went down. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious how, how he convinced you into that one. It, it was, was money, it was easy. <laughs> It was uh, exciting to go down and get to meet with you at, at your place, and it took me a little bit to find your house, <laughs> and I found it. I, I, and I was pretty dressed up, too. I usually don't get too dressed up, so I was, you know, definitely a little on the nervous side to, to sit down and talk to you, but I, I felt really good about it and just listening to what you had to say, and I just let Mr. H kind of figure out the rest, and <laughs> I didn't really care what I did last year as long as I got to end up here this year, so I was, uh, it worked out really well. Casey Kane now will work his way out of turn number four. He'll come down to the stripe. He'll get his first win of 2012. His first win for Rick Hendrick. To win that first one and feel like I was kind of part of the team at that point was, was definitely a, a good feeling for myself and our whole team. When you were running sprint cars and watching, and watching Jeff run sprint cars growing up, did you ever think you'd be his teammate? I never thought I would, no. Living in Washington, being out in the Northwest, the only way I could watch, you know, really Jeff or NASCAR, any of that stuff was was by TV. Thursday Night Thunders and 
Jeff Gordon has won for the third time this year. And then watching Jeff progress from there and running so well when he started driving for you, winning championships and races, I was uh, always a huge fan, and um, but never would have expected to, to be his teammate. I don't think that first meeting with me and you went quite the way that yours and Casey went. I don't remember. You had to we tell were in me your I office. Know. Yeah. I think I came with like a briefcase. You had a game. You had a Game Boy. Stash and and the yeah, I think I had the stash, the, the, the briefcase. Nice combo. Yeah, and then this, I had like a real magazine. He had this, <laughs> he had this trying to look pen, pencil mustache that I think he put on with an eyebrow pencil or whatever. <laughs> But he had a briefcase and he had a Game Boy and a <laughs> stock car magazine in it. That was it. <laughs> uh, Jimmy, what's your favorite moment since you've been here? Man, I've been so fortunate to have a lot of them. Um, Just pick a championship. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go to my first win. Jimmy Johnson off turn four, and he's going to win his 13th start. In my heart of hearts, I knew that I needed to have a strong year in my rookie year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With you and Jeff making the, the change to start a fourth team, the two cars housed in one building, to win that first race was, uh, you know, I'll, I'll never forget that day. I mean, it, it was really a moment where I started building true confidence in myself as a driver and that I, I deserved to be in Cup and deserved to be a part of Hendrick Motorsports. So that was a big, big day. Jeff, how about you? Oh, man, a lot of good ones as well. I go back to the inaugural Brickyard 400. As a kid growing up, I thought maybe I could make it to Indy just to drive around the track and be in the race. To go there with Hendrick and know that you've got a shot at winning it and then to actually pull it off. It was an amazing day. You know, it's, it's, it's one that can never be recreated just because it was the first, uh, you know, of, of its kind and historical. It changed my life, really. That, I mean, Hendrick Motorsports has changed my life. That day certainly uh, it's never been the same since. You think back to how it was years ago, and uh, you think about the points today, how tight they are. And I remember a lot of things like at Atlanta when you had the championship sewed up. Ray and I decided we were going to help pit the car. <laughs> Ray jacked, and I cleaned the windshield. Ray couldn't get the jack under the car, and I was falling over the jack trying to wash the windshield. You didn't have to have fire suits back then. So I think it was a 38 second pit stop. You know, you couldn't do those things anymore. Let me tell you, I've never laughed so hard in my life as <laughs> I did that day inside the car seeing you two come over pit wall. I, I thought they were joking when they told me this was gonna happen. It was a lot more fun to have those point leads back then. <laughs>It doesn't really surprise me that we're all here today, you know, after all that history. You've always had a way of making things work, you know, finding ways to put the puzzles together, and I feel lucky. I feel lucky. You look at the championships you've won and what a remarkable run we've had. I, I think about it all the time, how fate put us together and uh, how lucky I am that uh, be sitting here with you guys. It doesn't really surprise me that we're all here today, you know, after all that history. You've always had a way of making things work, you know, finding ways to put the puzzles together. And Y'all have really kind of perfected the way chemistry works between the two teams or four teams. And I think aside from just the fun we've had, how much I've learned as a driver and just learned about how teams work, how, how they can work better. And, get to know these guys better, get to know Jeff better. I've grew up watching, you know, being around Jeff and watching him race my dad for all those years to get to know him and get closer to him meant a lot to me and, and me and Jimmy were great friends. And so it's been, it's been a great experience. I feel lucky, I feel lucky. What I think makes it work um, it, are, are the people and everybody has to buy into it. And I guess subconsciously I knew about that coming up through the ranks, but coming here, watching you lead all of us and, and helping us understand that that's how it works and the way the system works has been, been great for me and it's an environment that I, I just can't see going on the racetrack any other way. This place is, is so different and it's different because of one person, yeah. Mr. Hendrick. And it's the attitude that Rick has and the way he treats everybody, not just us, but the employees here. And I think that's why people are so proud to have been part of this team. 
became family here quick. You know, Pop was here, and Rick was here, and it felt like family. And you know, Rick's always been one of those kind of guys to me that's like, can get, get more out of you than you ever knew you had. He had confidence in me, and he put a lot of faith in me, and I, I didn't want to disappoint him by not living up to his expectations. My father-in-law always told me, when they lay you to rest, if you had five people that were your best friends, you were a blessed man. Well, I know I got one here, so I'm getting close. That's the kind of person that you are, you know. You look at Hendrick Motorsports as family, and to me, it elevated this organization to a, another level. You know, I mean, it's just, it changed my life, really, and you drove that. So thank you, Rick. A lot of people think it's corny, but you grow together and you get tight and you care about each other, and then you go out with a mission to conquer and to win. I mean, it's just amazing how fast time rolls on. I've seen a million miles, met a million faces to call. I knew to reach all these places and I do it again if it brings me back to you. So have you ever been caught in a sea of despair? And your moment of truth is the day that you say I'm not enough, um, especially you, Rick, for believing in me, making this place feel like home for myself and everybody here. You know, we, we all feel like we're a part of the family, and um, we're, I'm just forever grateful for the opportunity and, and can't thank you enough. Well, I was a Yankee coming down in a Southern sport, so Rick, you, I owe you everything. It's all about people, and I thank you guys because Without you, this place wouldn't be here. From the five people up in the 10 building to 100 races and then 200 races and 10 championships. If you look through this place over almost 30 years now, everybody that's been here has put a brick on it. So, thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Oh.